Bern. Bern's medieval streets look organic, but they're actually Switzerland's perfectly executed grid system from 1191, meticulously planned by Duke Berchtold Vage. The goal wasn't just order, it was to create a defensible and commercially viable city from day one. The city sits on a peninsula surrounded by the Aare River, forcing planners to work with limited space. They created parallel streets running east to west with perpendicular alleys, maximizing every meter. The arcades covering six kilometers of sidewalks weren't romantic additions, they were practical solutions for rain and snow. Each building plot measured exactly 10 meters wide, preventing wealthy families from dominating entire blocks. This democratic approach to space still works today. Burns Old Town accommodates modern life without major renovations because medieval planners accidentally designed for pedestrians, cyclists, and trams. The Swiss spent $1.2 billion on underground parking instead of destroying historic streets. Compare that to American cities that demolished entire neighborhoods for surface lots. Bern proves that old doesn't mean obsolete when the original design prioritized people over vehicles. Berlin, Berlin's street pattern reveals every political regime that controlled it. The radial boulevards spreading from Alexanderplatz were Prussian power moves from the 1700s, wide enough for military parades and suppressing riots. Then Friedrich Wilhelm I added the grid system in expanding districts, mixing control with efficiency. You've probably seen this hybrid in Washington, D.C., which copied Berlin's approach. The radial grid combination creates confusing five-way intersections where streets meet at weird angles. Now after World War II, the ideological split was carved directly into the city's fabric. East Berlin got Soviet-style superblocks, while West Berlin built car-friendly suburbs. Reunification in 1990 forced planners to stitch together two incompatible systems. The result? Berlin now has 13 different street patterns depending on which neighborhood you're in. This chaos actually works because each zone serves different functions. The radial core handles tourism and government, our grids manage residential areas, and superblocks contain affordable housing. Berlin's design history is basically political ideology written in asphalt and concrete. Vienna, Vienna's Ringstrasse, is urban planning as propaganda. When Emperor Franz Joseph demolished medieval walls in 1857, he commissioned the most expensive street project in European history, $3 billion in today's money. The circular boulevard showcases imperial power through monumental buildings positioned at precise intervals. The Parliament, Opera House, and museums create a ring of culture around the historic center. But here's the catch. This impressive design was meant to control citizens, not serve them. Wide streets prevented revolutionaries from building barricades like they did in 1848. The Ringstrasse separates the wealthy inner districts from working-class outer zones, a division still visible today. Vienna's radial plan forces all traffic through the center, creating legendary congestion. Modern planners spent decades building a metro system to fix problems created 160 years ago. The city now spends $500 million annually maintaining imperial architecture that serves tourists better than residents. Vienna proves that beautiful design doesn't always mean functional design. Boston. Boston streets followed cow paths, and you can still feel it today. The city never had a master plan because it grew organically from 1630 onward. Neighborhoods developed around hills, shorelines, and property lines that made sense 400 years ago. This creates the urban maze that terrifies GPS algorithms and rental car drivers. The Big Dig Highway project cost $14.6 billion, partly because engineers couldn't find two parallel streets to work with. But Boston's chaos has unexpected benefits. The irregular blocks create diverse neighborhoods with distinct identities. Short, winding streets slow traffic naturally without speed bumps. The varied lot sizes allow buildings from different eras to coexist. You can't replicate Boston's organic growth because it required centuries of uncoordinated decisions by thousands of property owners. Modern planners tried to fix Boston with urban renewal in the 1960s, demolishing the West End's organic streets for sterile towers. That failure taught urban planners that organic patterns have value. Boston's navigational nightmare is actually a masterclass in human-scale urbanism that modern cities spend billions trying to recreate. Canberra. Canberra is what happens when you let architects design a capital city from scratch in 1913. Walter Burley Griffin won an international competition with his geometric garden city concept, concentric circles, grand axes, and ornamental lakes. The result looks spectacular from above and feels empty at street level. The city was designed for 25,000 people, but now houses 460,000, breaking every spatial assumption in the original plan. Those beautiful radial boulevards are six to eight lanes wide, making crossing the street an athletic event. 
the garden city concept means low density everywhere, forcing residents to drive for basic errands. Canberra has more cars per capita than anywhere else in Australia, despite having $2 billion worth of public transport. The geometric perfection creates neighborhoods separated by empty green space instead of connected by walkable streets. Parliament House sits on a hill five kilometers from the city center because Griffin thought democratic buildings should be isolated from commercial activity. This separation makes downtown Canberra feel abandoned after 5 p.m. The city spent decades trying to add density and mixed-use development to fix design flaws from 1913. Barcelona, Barcelona's Ike Sample District, is the world's most ambitious urban grid experiment. Ildefons Cerda designed it in 1859 with 133 meter square blocks and chamfered corners for better sight lines. Every block was supposed to have gardens in the interior courtyard and buildings on just two sides. That lasted approximately five minutes before developers built on all four sides, creating the dense urban fabric you see today. Cerda planned for 150,000 residents. The area now houses 270,000, but the grid system adapted better than anyone expected. Those chamfered corners reduced traffic accidents by 30% compared to right angle intersections. The regular block size made the metro system financially viable because ridership is predictable. Barcelona's recent superblock experiment restricts cars in three by three grid sections, returning streets to their original pedestrian-friendly purpose. Air quality improved 25% in pilot areas, proving Cerda's design can work for both 1860 horses and 2025 electric scooters. The grid cost $8 billion in today's money, but generates more in property value annually. Barcelona shows that rigid geometry can create flexible, livable urbanism if you get the dimensions right. Montreal. Montreal's a street grid rotates at weird angles because French colonial planners in 1672 aligned streets with the St. Lawrence River, not compass directions. This made sense for shipping but confuses every GPS on the planet, creating a local phenomenon known as Montreal North, which is actually Northwest. The original old Montreal grid was tiny, just 20 blocks. Then English planners added a perpendicular grid system after 1760. These two incompatible grids meet at brutal intersections where five streets converge at random angles. Montreal's underground city with 33 kilometers of tunnels was built because the surface street pattern made winter walking unbearable. The city spent $2 billion connecting metro stations, shopping centers, and office buildings underground rather than fixing the street layout. Modern Montreal added boulevards, highways, and suburbs without resolving the fundamental grid conflict. The result is a navigation nightmare where street names change randomly, and north means three different directions. But Montreal proves that dysfunctional street patterns don't prevent success. The city thrives despite its geometric chaos. The underground network attracted $5 billion in development specifically because the surface was hostile to pedestrians. Edinburgh. Edinburgh is two cities stacked on top of each other, separated by 70 meters of elevation and 500 years of history. The old town grew organically along a volcanic ridge from 1100 onward, creating the densest medieval streets in Britain. Buildings reached 11 stories because horizontal space didn't exist. Then the new town was built in 1765 as a Georgian planned district with perfect grid streets and elegant squares. The contrast is violent. Chaotic medieval alleys literally overlook geometric perfection. James Craig designed the new town grid to attract wealthy residents away from the overcrowded old town. It worked spectacularly creating one of Europe's most expensive residential districts. The two zones never integrated because connecting them required building bridges across the valley. Edinburgh's design proves that you can have both organic and planned urbanism in the same city if you separate them physically. The old town's medieval pattern now drives tourism revenue while the, the new town grid handles modern office functions. This accidental specialization created $12 billion in economic value from two incompatible urban systems. Like this video and subscribe to see more content exploring how cities actually work. We'll cover even more controversial urban planning topics next time.